Um, so my name is Matt Ellis. I'm a Director of Product Management and Strategy at Tipco Software, and I'm joined by Brom. Uh, I'm Abram van der Geest. I'm a machine learning engineer and architect uh, working in the um, Interconnect group. Cool. So we've got 59 minutes to torture you with. So um, from an agenda perspective, we're going to talk a little bit about kind of the rise of machine learning and how applications are being, or how applications are being developed and changing with machine learning and things like that. We'll talk about deep learning, AI, machine learning, and various other aspects of, of ML and how they relate to, to applications. Um, and then we'll kind of talk about some of the problems that, uh, that you might have with machine learning as you start embedding those into your applications. And then finally, we'll, we'll kind of go through a few demos, show you how to build apps, events, things like that. So we got a huge kind of a wide variety of things to talk about. So um, the first thing that I want to talk about is the rise of machine learning. So um, everybody's constantly talking about machine learning, constantly talking about AI and deep learning and neural nets and all this other stuff. But the fundamental fact is the way you build applications today is changing, right? So you, you build applications that are predictive and, uh, and um, so an application that's both predictive and prescriptive. So in other words, what might happen next and what should I do about it, okay? Rather than building traditional procedural applications, um, you're focusing on leveraging machine learning that's powered by data that you've been collecting to build these types of applications, right? So it kind of leaves you at an interesting, uh, an interesting dilemma. So does that mean the way we build software today is, is dead? So software in general is dead. Um, we're only going to build AI-powered stuff going forward. So. Does, does the world or the future look kind of like this, that AI, or is, AI is going to take over software, software as we know it is done and finished? I, I can clearly see you disagree. Who else? Who, who agrees with this slide? That's good. One person. OK. I'm sorry. <laughs> OK. Um, so, so a lot of people will have you believe this, right? So the way you build applications is radically it's disappearing. Software developers won't be around anymore. You're, you're leveraging machine learning and artificial intelligence to do automated tasks. But the reality is you're kind of not doing that, right? Um, machine learning is not always the answer. And in many ways, you do augment your applications with machine learning. But in many, in many other facets, simply doing some element of stream processing for real-time event-based applications um, is all you really need, right? You might, I don't know, you're calculating the average temperature over a certain duration, and then if that temperature exceeds a threshold, you, you execute a series of, um, series of rules or functions or something like that. So that might be all you really need. If you're going to look at leveraging machine learning, you have to understand that machine learning is best suited for classifying large quantities of data, such as images and text and things like that. Um, and you need the caveat here is you need sufficient data to train your ML model. So it's not, it's not magic. It's not like you're going to plug in ML, and then all of a sudden, you don't need a code anymore. You don't need data or anything like that. So with that, you might have heard some of these acronyms before. I think Brahm will kind of talk a little bit about these. Yep. So uh, before we go too deeply into some of the other uh, tasks and stuff that we're going to talk about, uh, I'm just going to quickly overview uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence, neural networks, deep learning, all these terms that you have heard probably 100 times, usually interchangeably, that machine learning and deep learning are the same thing. Um, and to be fair, if you get 10 data scientists into a room together with this slide, you'll probably get 20 different opinions. Um, so this is my opinion, but I think it gives you a general idea of the distinction between each term. Um, here I define machine learning as an algorithm that's focused on learning from data. So extracting new insights out of data. Uh, artificial intelligence, on the other hand, is a that is a computer system that tries to replicate uh, human intelligence or task or something that humans normally do. Uh, neural networks is a class of algorithms that is based off of the way the human brain works, um, mapped to linear algebra, um, that works really well with some uh, human-like tasks, such as vision, language understanding, stuff like that. Um, deep learning is a subset of neural networks 
that is a particular hierarchical form of neural, neural networks where each layer in um, a network is intended to um, detect some feature of its own and then build from there in each layer. Um, as you can see here, I have machine learning and artificial intelligence as two overlapping but different spheres. If you look online, uh, there are versions of this Venn diagram that have AI completely surrounding ML and vice versa. Um, the reason why I have them distinct is I would say that, say, um, linear regression is not artificial intelligence because actually human beings are really bad at drawing lines, particularly through data. And so that would be part of AI not in ML. Uh, sorry, ML not in AI. And then there are forms of AI that tend to be a little bit older that do not learn from data. There are rules-based. Um, now, they're not the most recent uh, and, or hottest topics, but they definitely do exist. So that is why I define them this way. So I'm going to go over these fairly quickly, but there are two types of machine learning, uh, supervised and unsupervised. Now, there's a lot of things that fit slightly in one bubble or the other, semi-supervised, so on and so forth. But really, the two big buckets for machine learning are um, the one that you basically have data where you know the answer. So you have both your x and your y, and you're trying to learn the function. Um, and this is often how you do categorization um, and try to find um, driving um, observed conditions or predict conditions. Blah. Sorry. Um, but you need a lot of labeled data uh, to do this, as Matt said. Um, unsupervised data, on the other hand, is you don't know what Y is. You only have your input data, your X, and you want to understand what that structure is. So you can uh, group your data. You can draw connections between various data points and all these kinds of things. Often, this is actually used to um, detect classes that you can then put into a classification or a supervised learning approach. Or it can just be a way to explore your data and extract out new useful information, new patterns. Um, and here we have two quick uh, demonstrations of um, supervised and unsupervised. On the left, we have linear regression, where you're basically just trying to draw a line through your data, such that when given x, you can uh, extract out y. Um, and then a good example of unsupervised learning is clustering, where in this case, um, the clustering algorithm would detect that there's three different clusters there. Um, there are lots of applications for machine learning. Uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail. Uh, these are basically um, some uh, applications that I just came up with uh, in five minutes for each of the six um, categories. There are even more categories in this, but this just gives you a general idea of what we can do. Um, the most common one that you probably run across is classification, but then there's also um, dimensionality reduction, outlier detection, lots of things. So now that we've covered quickly what machine learning is, um, as we progress um, and start moving machine learning into um, production, we run into a lot of problems. Um, it has become fairly common to be able to move uh, machine learning from the data scientist to the developer in that we move the model that, um, say, as a data scientist, whoops, sorry, uh, as a data scientist, I, in my Jupyter notebook, write um, a TensorFlow um, neural network that I just export. There's a dozen different ways to uh, import that into production. So I have a question oh. before you, you move on yeah, to the next sir. slide. How many people in the room are software developers? OK. How many people in the room are data scientists? OK. Cool. And um, a lot, how many people now, one last question. So all the, the stuff that you build from a data science perspective, are you looking at moving that into production? So that's for the data scientist, question for the data scientist. The question for the developer is, are you trying to consume machine learning artifacts that were built by somebody else in your apps? Yeah, kind of, maybe? Cool. OK. Sorry, go ahead. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to make that process easier make it easier for the data scientist to develop their um, tools or develop their model and hand it to the, data uh, to the developer. Um, because often we see that there is a disconnect where the data scientist um, writes something in Python and uh, has uh, some complicated feature set where they do polynomial combinations of time series data and hand that off to the developer and say, um, implement this, please. 
And the developer has some questions uh, such as, why are we doing this in Python? It should be in Go or Java. And um, in the end, everyone's confused. Um, so what, um, and that's largely because of different tooling, um, just uh, the idea of moving uh, a trained model from one place to another. Um, you have to reproduce your data. Um, and also, a lot of uh, the developer has different metrics of interest than the uh, data scientist. The data scientist is interested in accuracy and reproducibility, while the developer's uh, interested in the stability of their pipeline, uptime, and things like that. So as we move the, um, our model from, data from, from development into production, we actually have to keep both sets of metrics um, in mind as we do that. So um, it, this is that. So a developer and a data scientist has two different uh, processes that are very similar, but unfortunately, you really can't uh, just pull from one, from one to the other. A data scientist often loads large amounts of data all at once from a data lake that has been pre-cleaned. Um, uh, in a distributed manner, it, pre it further cleans the data, um, constructs their features. Then they train it in a distributed manner, often in Spark or something like that. Uh, then they validate and publish their model such that they can then hand it off to the developer. Um, either that's putting it in an S3 bucket or something like that. Uh, the developer, on the other hand, often handles um, a given event or a given uh, case. So um, we'll be talking more about events here in a little bit. But say a REST call comes in and the, um, uh, they now have to take the data out of the REST call, take it from this raw form, and clean it far more than um, many data scientists have to do, and put this into their model that they've gotten from the data scientist. And then they need to post-process the result, because usually it's not a simple yes-no response. And then you have to respond to the API call or your IoT event or something like that. So I'm just going to add one thing real quick there. So one of the really important keys to kind of understanding this is that when Brom goes through and cleans the data and he does whatever, he applies whatever algorithms he needs to apply to the, this, uh, you know, the static set of data to build a machine learning model, that same algorithm or similar algorithms need to be applied in real time in your applications, okay? So today, that leaves you with really only one option that I can think of, and that's coding it myself, right? Which is actually pretty challenging, because if Brom tells me, I don't know, what, what should I do, Brom? What kind of model or algorithm should I apply to the, my data? Well, you can uh, create a one-hot encoded um, polynomial combination of time series data. Sure. So if I, if I knew what he meant, then I'd still have to code that, right? And then test it. And then when he changes his mind, which he does often, then I have to recode it, redeploy it, and retest it. And it's this vicious cycle that never seems to end. Yep. And so basically, um, we want to make this process easier. Because often, can you see the, OK, you can't see the coal. Um, so often, uh, for a developer, you have a pipeline coming in where your data comes in. Um, enters a conveyor belt, goes through your uh, app, and it comes in as a lump of coal, leaves as some response where you've extracted out all the values, so it's a diamond now, um, where it often passes through a machine learning black box, some uh, TensorFlow um, hosting or, or Tensor, TensorServe or whatever the um, various apps are. Um, but right now, we don't have a box there for data cleaning. Usually, the developer has to go there and process the features and do this one-hot encoding um, linear combination of polynomials, that kind of thing. What we um, think we should be doing, in, uh, sorry, and so if I was better at PowerPoint, that wouldn't be a data cleaning box. That would actually be um, chisel and hammer that you're shaping it by hand. Um, what we want to be the case is that we have a black box where you just take, say, a JSON from the, uh, from the data scientist, and the d data comes in, enters the JSON, gets cleaned, such that it can easily, with a one-to-one -one mapping, go straight into the machine learning algorithm. And as such, we want to in uh, introduce Catalyst ML, which is a real-time data transformation tool that basically has um, a whole bunch, you know, it's a specification that includes about 85 operations or functions that allow you to process your data. These operations include 
um, one hot encoding. They include um, word embedding, uh, image, um, uh, image processing tools, a um, whole bunch of mathematical operations. Uh, Catalyst ML is entirely open source, both the spec and the current implementation. Uh, we are, uh, it is language agnostic in the specification, so we are going to grow from our single implementation to further uh, implementations. Um, and this allows us to embed into real-time event apps your um, feature pipeline such that the developer doesn't have to do it all by hand. Um, and we've intentionally set it up such that one of the primary use cases is that you can do a one-to-one -one mapping where the output of your um, Catalyst ML uh, implementation is piped directly into your machine learning algorithm so that there's no need for any further cleaning or processing. So, okay, let's see if I can get the right button here. So here I have in SageMaker. Um, Uh, a JSON object that is defined by the Catalyst ML uh, specification, where I have some metadata describing the uh, the model. Uh, sorry, the uh, CML structure, where I have a name, a description, what version it is, when it was created, and then it's from there. It's basically broken into three parts. We define what kind of data is coming in, um, an array, a map, a string, whatnot, um, and give it a name such that we can refer to it. In the, uh, for in the next portion. Next, we have a structure or a pipeline that lists what operations you want to do to your data. And so here I've got um, a concat map, normalize, one hot encoding, that kind of thing. And then at the end, we have basically an output that is very similar to the input where we define what type is leaving and we can uh, use a name that is defined in our uh, structure for our output. And here I've got something very simple where we're just taking the final uh, output from an operation and putting it, in, uh, uh, putting it into the output, but you can actually construct a complicated map or object um, containing different parts so you can do multiple uh, chains of uh, transformation such that you can extract a out a large amount of data. Um, so we have created um, a Python API that allows us to generate this uh, CML uh, structure, this JSON, with just some basic code in, within Python. So here we see um, I basically import the library, and then from there, um, I also include date time just so that I can put in a, um, a new creation date. Um, it defaults to today. But um, what we start with is we create a CML structure, which is just an empty JSON with an uh, input, um, an empty structure and an empty output, but it includes you know, financial structure, cleaning of financial data as the description and name. So I just realized I'm talking about CML. Our quick uh, little demo here is I have some financial data that is basically credit card transactions that we want to determine whether it's fraud or not. And it comes in as, um, a series of, takes a second to load here, but it comes in as categorical data that, come on, comes in as categorical data, um, unnormalized values, that kind of thing. So with our CML maker, um, we basically start off by inputting, create, defining an input, which is, in this case, an array of uh, that we name inputs, so basically, in this case, the reason why it's an, an array is the um, application that Matt will be building here in a little bit is um, uh, takes the data in as a single um, array of data in a data frame type format. So this first operation I do uh, uh, takes a list of data frames and concats them all together into a single data frame. From there, um, I know that I need to normalize, say, the age value um, to be able to put it into my machine learning uh, model. And so I can um, use the Python help command to look at the object and determine what I need to define. As you can see here, I need to um, put in an input object that contains the data I want normalized, the value I want to normalize it by, 
And if you're normalizing data that doesn't start at zero, uh, you can include a minval. And so from there, I just normalize the age, amount, and uh, categories. And then I include the replace value. So I'm basically just substituting male, female, 401. Um, and then I do one hot encoding of uh, three or four different columns. So I take uh, the bank category and break it up into one column for each uh, bank, so on and so forth for each of these other columns. Um, I continue to normalize some other uh, columns. Um, and then I do, uh, for those of you who aren't uh, aware of it, when I've been saying poly polynomial combinations, you basically, once you've normalized all your data or one hot encoded it, you do just take multiplications of different columns. This often helps you extract out useful information that your model acts on much more easily than if you didn't do these processes. So I just uh, create a couple of these columns um, here. And then finally, um, my machine learning model takes out, um, or takes in um, a, an array instead of a map, so I just convert it into a table. Um, from there, I just define um, what the order um, of each column should be, and then I export it, and I define an output object as an array of data tab. Um, then you can see here, I have the JSON object, which I then export or write to file, which I can download from um, SageMaker. And so that's just a quick overview of uh, CML. So, so the notion behind this is as, as you as a data scientist are going through and cleaning your data and prepping it and doing whatever else you do with your data using whatever framework you might want to use, right? The, the notion is that you embed this alongside your data cleaning steps so that you capture those steps and you capture those steps in a in a consumable JSON artifact that the developer can then consume in their applications and then apply the same data transformations within their applications that you just did in, in the, the Python API. So that's the notion behind it. It's not meant to replace your Python data cleaning stage or steps or anything like that. So basically the idea is now that I have this JSON, I can um, just hand it off to Matt and he can put it into his application, which he will talk about doing here I will. So just kind of shifting gears a little bit, I'm going to kind of switch over to app, app dev and talk a little bit about event processing and event, uh, events in general. So um, it's pretty common, pretty obvious that events are pretty much everywhere. Everything we do and everything we interact with is essentially an event, right? So um, I don't know. I've got this uh, on my badge. I've got this, this card reader that people can scan me. That's an event, right? Um, I use my credit card somewhere, that's an event. Um, whatever, you know, how I interact with the, the world is essentially, become, is essentially boiled down into individual events. So with all of those events being produced, um, you need to look at a shift in the way you build applications, right? So if you're gonna process these millions or billions or even trillions of events that are coming in, you need to look at shifting the way you build applications. So, Typically, we started with big monolithic applications. So I had an idea, I would sit down, I would build this giant application, and whenever it changed, I had a ton of different code that I needed to make changes to, and so on and so forth. And then I shifted over to microservices. So how many people are, have built or, and or managing and building and deploying microservices today? Okay. So most of the developers. Most of the developers, exactly. So then the, the next shift, um, which I wouldn't even say is a shift, right? It, it's almost all, you almost augment your microservice development with, with functions, okay? So now you, instead of building microservices, which may have five, six operations in that microservice, you start building functions, and these functions have single operations, okay? So an individual function does just one thing and does one thing well. Um, which means that you have a lot more functions than you did microservices and a lot more than you would have with Monolith. Um, but I would also argue that you're not, functions aren't replacing your microservices. You'd kinda, you have, they both coexist. Um, and then you look at the platform in which you wanna deploy these, these functions, say something like AWS Lambda or what have you. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a few minutes. Back to the notion of an event. So what we've tried to do is distill down the notion of event into, it, into the most simple form possible. And, event, and that is, an event is just something that happens, right? It's me spilling my coffee all over the table or on my computer, which I do frequently. Um, it's just something that happens, okay? 
So if you distill an event down into that notion, then the next question is, how do you want to process that event? So oftentimes, individual events on their own are absolutely meaningless, okay? So a single event has no meaning by itself, but maybe if you take this event and you aggregate it over a period of time, all of a sudden you could produce derived events from, from a series of events. So, so again, an example of, um, I don't know, temperature over a period of time. So an individual temperature reading may not be useful, but if you aggregate that over a period of five or 10 minutes, maybe you could produce something that is, is of meaning, okay? So we call that stream processing. And then the other notion of an event is maybe every single event actually does have meaning and you wanna process every single event one at a time. So we've got a notion of kind of event processing via you know, a, a, essentially a process flow or a process engine. So as one event comes in, you, you, you take that event and you manipulate it. You have some element of conditional logic and you kind of continue to manipulate it down a pipeline until you're finished with it and you've written something to a data store or you've you know, notified somebody or you've done something like that. And then the last notion of an event is, um, is event correlation, okay? So this is, this is actually pretty interesting in the context that it's an event that comes in, but a single event on its own may not have a ton of meaning. So let's, let's pick a concrete example. Let's say, for example, um, I don't know, I see, a, I see a woman walking in a, you know, a nice, beautiful white dress, okay? Fine, whatever. And now I see a limousine come by, hmm, okay. And then I see somebody with rice and throwing rice and I hear music and oh, it must be a wedding or something like that, right? So you're able to take individual events, persist them into memory, and then apply, as new events come in, apply or correlate the past historical events with these new events and then deduce something or derive a more complicated meaning out of these individual events. And that's what we mean by event correlation and rule processing. So we've got an open source project, Project Logo, 100% open source. Um, we've built it using Golang. So out of curiosity, out of uh, all the developers in the room, how many developers code in Go? Two people, okay. Three. Three, okay, three people. Um, so we, we built it in Go, and one of the reasons why we built it in Go was, um, was partly because, due to the fact that Go is, um, from a language perspective, it's, it's pretty simple and it actually encourage, sim encourages simplicity, right? So you, you code so people can actually read and understand your code. You're not trying to code super complicated objects that, uh, that you're trying to use to show off with or something like that. The other reason is that the applications themselves are um, compiled. So rather than interpreted, they're actually compiled into binaries, so they run relatively quickly. And then they also yield a very efficient binary. So we're talking about a binary size that's a couple megabytes in size, and it also has no additional OS dependencies. So where, as if you use something like Java or even Node.js, you, um, you, no you need all the stuff that comes along with Node.js, you need the JRE if you're using Java, things like that. Um, in the case of Go and the applications built using Go, you don't need any of that. So that's the reason why we chose Go. Um, another important thing to call out is that we wanted to build a framework that enabled app developers to target a number of different platforms. So things all the way from IoT edge devices up to serverless compute. So you can build a single application and choose your deployment target and not have to make changes to your application. And then the last call out here is machine learning. I'll kind of talk a little bit more about that, but in baking in native machine learning capabilities into Flogo was also something that's super important, kind of going back to the notion or that original point that, that the way you build applications are changing and you're starting to leverage ML in your apps and they're not just ancillary components that you might call as an API, but in fact they're kind of, uh, they act in a supporting role of your app. And we'll talk a little bit more about that and kind of dissect that in just a few as well. So to dissect some of these different event processing capabilities, what we've done is we've built an overarching ecosystem or a core set of components that um, have ancillary event processing capabilities on the, on the outside, okay? So integration flows is our, is our process engine, so it's, it's, it's pretty simple. It's, it's, think of it almost as like a BPM type process engine, but for short-lived processes, okay? So they're for sh 
they're not for long running processes, they're for short lived things that come in, you process this event, you transition from one thing to another, you've got conditional logic and branching and things like that, and you can do this in a visual fashion as well. The next one is uh, stream processing. So it kind of just ties straight into those notions of event processing that we talked about. Um, in the case of stream processing, then you've got the, the notion of being able to group and join events from multiple data sources. So you can consume from Kafka, from MQTT, from Coop, REST, what have you. Consume from all these data sources, and then group and join across these data sources, process them in, a, in an individual pipeline, and then aggregate and filter and execute machine learning models and things like that within the pipeline itself. So I mentioned native ML capabilities. Um, from this perspective, we're really talking about TensorFlow. So um, we've taken TensorFlow and we've baked TensorFlow into the framework so that you could leverage or in inference TensorFlow models natively within your application. So as you're, you know, you're branching and you've got conditional logic, you can call a TensorFlow model with relative ease, um, as in, and I'll show you in just a few minutes, putting a, a, a block on a diagram and saying, this is the TensorFlow model, this is the model that I want to invoke, and here's the input that I want to pass into it. So all of this, great, right? So you use this, you build your event-driven applications, but you still need to deploy those applications somewhere. So how many people leverage serverless compute today? How many? Sorry, I missed that. One, two, three? OK. And you're doing that through Lambda, right? AWS Lambda? Yeah? OK. Um, so from a serverless perspective, some of the reasons why I really like serverless is because it embraces these really core principles. Number one, there's no servers to manage, OK? So you can leverage something like AWS Lambda, and you don't have to worry about any server, OK? So there's nothing else to manage from that perspective. You, your application scales with usage, so you don't need to worry about how do you maintain and manage servers, how do you manage the scale of your application and things like that. You literally, it can literally scale from zero all the way up to infinity, theoretically, I suppose. Um, and then also, you only pay for what you use, OK? So if you've don't have any events coming in, you're not paying for anything. You pay for the events that come in, which is, is really, really valuable, especially from the concept of, you know, if you're a startup company or you're kind of you're building an application, you don't really know how many events you're going to consume, and you, um, you want to scale up and down as, as your, your business demands change. So that's, that's super important. And then the last one is the um, fault tolerance is natively built in. So what essentially happens in Lambda is when an event comes in, Lambda will spawn your function and then pass that event to your function, and then your function will execute whatever logic you've defined within your function. Um, if another event comes in and that particular instance crashes or something like that, it doesn't really matter because Lambda will spawn up another one. So you constantly have fault tolerance natively baked into the platform. So it's not something that you need to think about, and it's not an afterthought. So if you kind of then take the, all of those no concepts and you distill it down into a few things, I'm not going to read them all out, but greater agility, load balancing, things like that, increased scale. Um, and I think the most important is probably faster time to market, right? So you don't have to deal with what platform you're deploying to. You don't have to deal with you know, administering anything. You simply worry about your code, and you deploy your function to Lambda, and that's, that's essentially it. So if you look at some of the terms that I've been throwing out here, um, you've got this notion of event-driven compute. You've got functions as a service, and you have serverless, OK? So Lambda is a serverless platform, is a serverless functions as a service platform that is triggered via events, essentially, OK? So um, you can have a function platform that's not serverless. Um, but in the context of Lambda, Lambda kind of encompasses all of this, so I think that's that's what makes Lambda very, very unique, and, and quite honestly, more unique than any of AWS's other competitors. So when you go to build an application, there's a couple things that you look at. So the event source, what am I connecting to, or what is that, that thing that's changing? OK, so connect to a data store and capture changes from a data store, expose a REST interface, um, connect to a, a messaging topic or something like that. Um, whatever, it, whatever event source you might connect to is something that the platform, Lambda, supports. So you connect to that event source, 
and then that event source routes that event to your function. And your function simply executes the code that you've given it. So there, there are several different um, languages that you can use to build your functions. And one of them is Project Logo. So Project Logo enables you to natively, graphically build applications and natively deploy those applications to AWS Lambda so they run within the context of Lambda um, itself. So if you look at kind of a, a high level deployment topology or, or how, how different components would call one another, look at this example. So I've got an, an Amazon API gateway that's deploying some endpoint, um, some REST endpoint or something like that, and then that calls a Flogo function. That Flogo function could then call, say, something like Amazon SQS or DynamoDB or things like that, or it could call other Flogo functions and, and, and so on and so forth. So I'm gonna stop talking about that and I'm going to switch over to the demo. Okay, so the first thing I wanna show you is the Flogo user interface. So I said that Flogo was a, a way to graphically build um, applications or event-driven applications. It, it supports more than just a graphical representation. There is a Go API as well, so if you choose to build applications using the Go API, you can actually do that, and you can even mix and match. So, you could have some developers, developers in a team that might use the graphical interface, and then some developers that would rather code, and then the developers that are coding could consume the graphical representation within their apps as well and call them just like a function. So we'll kind of get into all that in just a minute. So here's my web interface. So the web interface, uh, when I first land on the web interface, um, I've got a... Uh, you know, a series of applications that, uh, that I've already built. I can build it, you know, add a new one or import an application. In this case, I've got an app called reInvent 2019. So if we go into that, the next thing you're presented with is the action or the implementation that you'd actually like to code, okay? So if I go new action, you can see here that I can add a flow and I could add a stream. And again, these are bound to those, you know, three core principles of event-driven or event processing that I talked about earlier. So what I have right now is the a fraud detection example. So let's go ahead and look at that. So this is a, a flow or a process pipeline, okay? So the first thing I wanna call out is the process pipeline, essentially everything in this gray box is basically a function. So you can consider that to be a function. So just like a function, you've got inputs and you have outputs. So if I go ahead and look at this, my, I can have inputs associated with my function, okay? And those inputs, they're actually the same inputs that, uh, that Abram showed us in his uh, sample CSV file. So I've got inputs and I've got outputs, okay? So just, just like a regular function. Um, and the kind of cool thing about that is the fact that if I, if I decouple the event source from the logic, then I could add as many events as I'd like into my, uh, my application. So right now, I've got one event that's an AWS Lambda trigger, so I can, uh, I can deploy this as a Lambda application, but I've got another event that's a simple HTTP event source, okay? So I can also expose this as a simple HTTP service, maybe deploy this off to Kubernetes or something like that and run it on, on, uh, um, on AWS as a container or something like that. So the first thing I'm doing here is I'm, I'm just taking in the message and I'm logging it, the second thing I'm doing here is calling the Catalyst ML specification, okay? So, I'm gonna show you what that looks like. So here's the call to Catalyst ML. So all I'm literally doing is passing into Catalyst ML. I don't know why all the mappings are empty, but anyway, we'll assume they're not empty. So all I'm really doing is, is taking the input mappings that, that came in from, uh, from my input and then I map them to Catalyst ML. Inside Catalyst ML, it processes the, uh, the data, and I'll show you the application running as well in just a minute. And I want to interrupt just long enough to say that when I mentioned that Catalyst ML has one implementation, it's a Flogo slash Go implementation that we are using here. Sorry. Cool, okay. So, um, okay, so now that I built my application, so I can simply come into here, and all I really have to do is, um, let's go ahead and delete this guy, actually. I can really come into here and just start adding different activities and different, different logic that I want to execute. So the notion behind Flogo is I assemble my logic using these building blocks, okay? And the building blocks are called activities, and these activities implement concrete logic. Write to a database, read from a database, publish a Kafka message, uh, you know, process a Catalyst ML spec or something like that, right? 
So um, I can come in here and I can add any of these, invoke a REST service, whatever, whatever the case is. I can also add conditional logic. So I could branch this, I could add something else here, and then that something else can have conditional logic associated with it. So I could say something like, um, you know, only if the transformed output dot whatever name is equal to, is equal to that, then, then that branch gets executed. So basic conditional logic and branching and flow control. When I finish with my application, I can come here and I can build it. So I can build the application for a target platform. So if I'm gonna bundle this up as a container, I'd build it for a target platform. I'd build it for, you know, for Linux, okay? But if I'm gonna deploy to Lambda, I can actually hit the uh, Flogo AWS Lambda uh, option here, and then what it'll do is build a function that I can then upload to, uh, to Lam the Lambda management console, or I can use you know, the API, or I could use SAM, or something like that. Um, for this particular example, all I did was deploy it to the, uh, to the uh, Lambda console. So I built a function, okay, in Lambda. I came down to that function. I selected the runtime as go, and then I uploaded the zip file that was produced by the, uh, the UI. And then I can go ahead and test this. So let's, let me show you what the test looks like. So the, um, the can you see that okay? Okay, the, so the sample test data, basically looks like that same thing that Abram just showed us. So what is the, what is the, uh, you know, the, what are the, the various inputs for those offense, events? So this is a fraud example, so you've, you're getting credit card transactional data, as well as the person's age and whatever. Um, so, you know, their age, their, the amount that they use, the bank, whether it was, a, you know, the, the card type, if it was a chip or swipe, and so on and so forth, and various other elements associated with the transaction. So remember, the, the tricky part to all this is that if I invoke a machine learning model, that ML model actually has a different input expected, okay? So the, the TensorFlow model that Abram built actually expected, I think, like 38... Um, 30. 30. 30, uh, 30 inputs of type double, okay? But if you look at the uh, real-time data that's coming in, I've got, I've, I've got this data. So I need to take this and I need to transform it into these 30 fields of type double, okay? So we'll use Catalyst ML to do that. So if I go ahead and hit the test function, a couple things happen. So it's successfully run. I can see the output of the Catalyst ML activity. So in this case, you've got the 30 some odd rows or, or data elements that get passed into the TensorFlow model. So I could take that and from a one-to-one -one perspective, that maps directly into TensorFlow. So from a developer standpoint, I don't need to do anything else. I don't need to write any more code. I've got the JSON spec that, uh, that Abram had given me that, that he produced through his Python, uh, Python code. I simply execute that in line within my application, and that's, that's it, okay? The next thing I wanna call out here. Um, I'm gonna interrupt for a sec. Yeah. Um, and so you can see that the output is basically um, a matrix that is 30 by one, so it's just one row. Um, I can show you here in a sec that the um, TensorFlow model we use, that its input is exactly a 30 by one uh, matrix. Where's that? So, um, so here, that is totally too small to see. So here I've just used a command line tool from TensorFlow that, um, to show that the inputs is um, of whatever, uh, however many events you wanna look at. So in this case, it's minus one means up up to infinity number of rows and 30 columns. And then as the output, it would say um, zero or one for the data. Cool. Okay, so, so that gets transformed one to one into TensorFlow. You invoke your TensorFlow model, you get back a result whether or not it was you know, a fraudulent transaction. The other thing that I wanna show you from a Lambda perspective and for specifically from a Flogo perspective, which I think is pretty cool. So the duration of this invoke was 3.46 milliseconds. So it took 3.46 milliseconds to take in the event, transform the data as specified by the data scientist, and then invoke a TensorFlow model, right? And then the other thing that's pretty cool is the fact that um, it's only taken, it only consumed 47 megabytes of, of memory, okay? So unfortunately, from a Lambda perspective, you can't you know, select my billing element to say use you know, whatever, 64 megabytes of memory or something like that. So I think 128 megabytes is the smallest uh, smallest that you can, you can select when you specify your function. 
But, um, but the point is the Flogo binaries themselves are super efficient from a resource standpoint. So I'm going to stop there. I think there's like one or two more slides, and then we'll ask questions. OK, so the last thing that I kind of want to reiterate are the really the, the key, key points that you should embrace when you're building event-driven applications, specifically event-driven applications that embrace machine learning, OK? So number one, obviously it needs to be event-driven. Um, so you'd want to use the notion of the event-first design pattern um, and, and things like that. You need to embrace microservices and functions. So um, build a microservice that you deploy to Kubernetes or something like that. Build, uh, build serverless functions that you deploy to AWS Lambda and really leverage the platform to, to scale out as opposed to, um, as opposed to building monolithic applications. Machine learning. Um, start embracing machine learning as you build your application. So you're not building applications that have static set of code anymore, right? You're building applications that are both predictive and prescriptive. Again, what's going to happen and what should I do about it? That element needs to be baked into your application, um, and, and that needs to become kind of a first-class um, asset as you continue to build out your applications. And then kind of the last element, um, a little bit tied with the microservices and functions, is really deploying anywhere. So you're building applications that are resource efficient yet powerful, but applications that you can target as, um, as applications that run on IoT Edge devices or even serverless compute. So I'm sure you're about to ask this question, but how do you get started? So um, go ahead and go to you know, github.com slash project logo. Take a look at the open source project. Um, GitHub.com slash typical software slash catalyst ML to take a look at the specification, which also has a reference to the, uh, the Flogo implementation um, with a bunch of other examples and demos and things like that. So, questions? Not all at once, come on. All right, thank you, everyone. Thank you.